Good morning, church. It is, I'm glad that I can be here. I came back from Denver last night, and the way that air travel has gone, I said, Larry, get ready in case I don't make this flight or the flight doesn't get me here. So I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people are tired of eating compliment sandwiches. And if you don't know what that is, it's not something that you'll find at a deli, but more likely at a business office being served by a manager to an employee. It is a form of constructive criticism that's designed to soften the blow by you know, saying something nice before and afterwards. For example, you did a great job on that presentation, but... Your PowerPoint slides were confusing, and the font you used was borderline unreadable. But you ended with that funny joke, everyone laughed, so good job. Example, there are times when a compliment sandwich like that works well, but give enough of them, and they lose their effectiveness. Praise starts to seem insincere. And when you do give a genuine compliment, people might start to, to brace for the criticism that's going to come next. Or worse, the blow is softened so much that the feedback isn't heeded or taken seriously. Personally, I tend toward being a people pleaser, and I don't like making people feel bad. But sometimes they need to hear feedback that they're not going to like, and it's for their own good. In that case, it's often better to be direct and to the point. And it may still be hard to give, but if you have a good relationship with them and they know that you, that you have their best interest at heart, it's likely that a compliment sandwich just isn't necessary. Well, we're spending time with the Old Testament prophets this summer, and if you haven't noticed it by now, there are very few compliment sandwiches to be found in their messages or many compliments at all. The prophets spoke on behalf of God to issue warnings to Israel, and the language that they used was often dire and, and even angry, which did not make them very popular in their time, nor even today. And I've been up front for the last couple of months about the difficulty of preaching the prophets, something that I was challenged to do this summer, and it has been challenging I found it easier to preach through Revelation last year. But these are words of God preserved in the Bible that have been handed down from generation to generation because every generation has needed to hear them. So are you ready for this? We're going to be hanging out with Isaiah for the next couple of weeks. And today we'll be beginning right in Isaiah chapter 1. There is no gentle introduction. It immediately begins with God basically saying, Hey, Israel, listen up. Sit up and pay attention. Because I will not be repeating myself. God was angry and had important criticism for Israel to hear. So this is how it begins. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we read this. The vision concerning Judah... In Jerusalem, that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they've rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only 
wounds and welts and open stores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. And unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, the, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash, make yourself clean, take your evil deeds out of my sight, stop doing wrong, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. If I were Israel... I would feel just a little blindsided. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen to you? Or are you just walking along and all of a sudden somebody has something to say? Wait a minute. Is Isaiah talking about us? We love God. We are God's people. A whole nation devoted to God. We worship God all the time. We give to God our sacrifices. We show up on all the holy days. Isn't that enough Isaiah here is saying that it isn't. Not only, not only that, he's saying that God hates it. Hate is a strong word. What's going on here? Well, to figure that out, let's explore more about who Isaiah's audience is and why God might be saying these things. Now, it's not too different of an audience that we saw with Amos last month. Even though Amos and Isaiah were separated by centuries, the situation hadn't really changed. Now, while um, Isaiah ministered through the reign of four kings of Judah, beginning around 740 B.C., and unlike Amos the farmer, Isaiah spent most of his time in the city of Jerusalem. And whereas Amos prophesied during a time of peace and prosperity... Isaiah lived during the time that Amos warned was coming. And the first few verses that we read paint a picture of desolation in Judah. Their cities burned with fire. This was likely the invasion of the Assyrians by, led by Sennacherib, detailed in Isaiah 36 and 37, which itself borrows heavily from 2 Kings 18 and 19. The city of Jerusalem was still standing, but it was in a precarious position. A comparison is made to Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities in Genesis that were completely destroyed, saying that unlike them, at least the Lord left us some survivors. But then immediately in verse 10, Isaiah turns that, 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 that allusion back, and he addresses his audience as 
the rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah. Now this is a common reference in the prophets to, to God's divine judgment against a wicked people. And what made them wicked? Why was God so angry at them? Well, Isaiah is going to get into it, but later Ezekiel is very upfront about it. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. This is something that Isaiah, <clears throat> this was a hundred years um, before Ezekiel, Isaiah was delivering the exact same criticism. And before then, we saw this with Amos. All of them warned that if God's people didn't repent, they would eventually meet the same consequences of their actions, or rather their inaction. See, it wasn't so much what, about what they were doing, but about what they weren't doing. See, they were worshiping God in all the ways that they were supposed to. And it may seem that Isaiah was criticizing the, that whole system of Jewish worship from the sacrifices to the festivals to the prayers, but he wasn't. God wasn't mad about that. What really infuriated God was that they were worshiping God with bloody hands, stained with the oppression of other people. For God, worship is directly connected to ethics. For Christian to, Christians today, our system of worship is very different than Judah's. What we do here is a lot different than what they did in the temple. But that fact remains. God cannot tolerate worship that is carried out by people who mistreat others and allow the mistreatment of others, especially the powerless and defenseless. And if the people in Isaiah's audience still weren't sure exactly what he's talking about, in verses 16 and 17, he gets very specific, uses short sentences about how they could cleanse themselves. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the, the widow. These are all things that Sodom failed to do and which Israel was failing too. And if they wanted to avoid the same fate, they needed to turn themselves around and learn to do good. In verse 18, God says, let's settle this. But this wasn't up for debate. There wasn't any room for a rebuttal. The people had to accept God's evaluation of the situation because what else were they going to do? Try to tell God that he had it all wrong? And there's no sense lying to the judge when the judge of this case is an all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipotent creator of the cosmos. But despite having seemingly coming out swinging, Isaiah eventually had some good news for Judah. If you were familiar with any part of Isaiah 1 before, it was probably verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. That's in a few hymns that we sing. We're familiar with this. But it hits differently in context, doesn't it? In my opinion, it's even better. We have to read those verses of judgment and condemnation before we get to the verses of reconciliation and healing because then we see the beauty of what God is offering God's people. When God said, let's settle this, based on what was before this, they might have been bracing for even more punishment, but that's not what God does. Instead of leaning into retribution, God leans into restoration. God isn't a prosecutor seeking to condemn, but an arbiter offering a way forward. God was angry, but that didn't stop God from loving Israel. And the only thing God wanted now was to see them clean. God didn't want them to go the route of Sodom and Gomorrah. God wanted them to witness and to be a new and glorious Jerusalem again. 
And that's exactly why God is saying all of these hard judgments, because that new and glorious Jerusalem was coming, and it was going to be good for everyone, for all people, no matter who they were. If there was any injustice or oppression, and if someone was hurting or suffering, it was not the community that God had intended it for it to be. God had so much better planned. And if they wanted to be God's people, they needed to have the same priorities that God had. And God had a heart for the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden and those at the bottom and at the margins of society. God always has and God always will. And this is what the prophets continually reminded and hammered home, as did Jesus himself, that if God's people ever lose sight of that, whether it was 2,700 years ago or today, The people who claim to be God's people are going to get a word from a prophet telling them to wake up, sit up, and pay attention. Because the fact is, we cannot live this life on autopilot. We cannot worship God, go through the motions and routines, and then continue on with our lives. Because that will not cut it. It is insufficient. It is not the kind of worship that God desires or accepts. We cannot simply be people who offer thoughts and prayers and move on. James said that faith without works is dead. We have to be doers, people who live out our faith, not just on Sunday, but every day. We have to be men and women of action who actively seek justice, intentionally defend the oppressed, deliberately take up the cause of the fatherless, and purposely plead the case of the widow. Those were just a few examples that Isaiah gave, but there's so much more that we can do, which God is calling us to do, pleading with us to learn to do good. And whatever that might mean, God has given us creative imaginations and empowered us with so many skills and abilities. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. It transforms us into dreamers and doers in the name of Jesus. And that is how we worship. That is what God desires. We come together every Sunday, and what we do in this one hour is not the end-all, be-all of worship, but it is the inspiration and motivation for the worship that happens throughout the rest of the week. We sing songs to God together. We pray together. We celebrate communion together. And all of these things, they draw us together and then send us out. Until we are drawn back together and then sent back out. Until then we are drawn back together and then sent back out. And in this way, worship is a rhythm, a heartbeat, a breath, a life that we live together in which we as a community every week are re-centered and realigned with the heart of God and through which God is magnified and glorified in praise. It is a life that gives us cleansing from sin and into righteousness and justice, redeeming us into the abundant life of Jesus Christ, which has no end and will one day reign over the new Jerusalem with all of God's holy people forever and ever. For this is the gospel we are preaching, and the good news we are proclaiming not just with our words, but with our lives. We do so with our goodness in so many different ways. May the world see it. May our neighbors see it. And through it, may they know the goodness of our God. If you want to know more about the God that we serve, that we worship, and the goodness of our Lord Jesus, we would love to tell you and to show you. Just let us know. If you are in need of encouragement or prayer, and if we can minister to you, You can find me, find one of our elders or Stephen ministers, and we'll pray with you today. 
Together, let us do good and learn to do good. And in all things, may God receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen.